So hello everybody, my name is Oksana Maros, I'm PhD in Cultural Studies, although I prefer to represent myself today, at least within this lecture, uh, within the fields of Trauma Studies and Memory Studies. Today I want to talk a little about Trauma Studies, its origins and paradoxes, and through all the lecture I will rely not only on the names you already know, as I believe, I will add some authors whose works are usually perceived as optional for these fields, but in my opinion they add analytical potentials that one should not ignore at all. Let's start by mapping the theory. I will pay today special attention to discourse of trauma studies that is related to the Russian academic traditions. I would also like to picture out the regions of trauma studies, its optics, which is responsible for typical or invariant outsidedness of trauma as phenomenon. So please be ready that we will not focus on such authors as, for example, Andrew Hoskins or Annette Markham, who work within or with the concept of memory and remembering in highly contemporary or to be specific, to be precise, in digital environments. Surely you can sum uh, their approaches up in many publications and I believe in you. So what about mapping the theory? Trauma studies is first of all a set of concepts for the study of culture and social patterns or frames, which Russian and American literary scholar, essayist and philosopher Mikhail Epstein calls one of the most dynamic fields of the humanities, at least in the last decade of the 20th century. For a long time, until I believe 2010s, it was presented by mainly foreign researchers or Russian academics who were actively involved in the international communications. Those were specialists in cultural studies, in social science. Uh, there were anthropologists, historians, psychologists who turned to its epistemological heritage, to the epistemological heritage of the trauma theory. Suffice it to say that the first multi-authored monograph available for Russian-speaking readers was published only in the late 2000s. Imagine that. Its title was Trauma Points, in Russian, Travma uh, Punkte, and it was some kind of a language game, since this phrase can be considered as a homonym for the Russian word Travma Punkt, or an English emergency room. Uh, these are few names uh, of historians within the trauma studies. I think some of them are quite known to you. For example, Eric Sandner, Dominic LaCapra, uh, Catherine Merridale. Also, I can name anthropologists, for example, Sergei Ushakin and uh, Juliet Mitchell. And there are also philologists, Mark Lipovetsky, Katie Karut, and social scientists, Elena Rajdestvinska, Elena Trubina, and Peter Stompka. And also, we can recall the papers by uh, cultural sociologist Jeffrey Alexander. All these professionals regularly turn their discussions to the traumatized experience as an essence of life in circumstances of modernity. Of course, the list of authors within trauma studies within this field goes beyond these names. And here you can see the titles of some other important papers. However, mentioned authors are pretty representative for Russian tradition uh, and uh, for Russian introduction with this field, as most of them were the authors of the papers for the Trauma Points volume. So, uh, we also shouldn't forget that the study of the specifics of trauma in Russian culture, both on thematic and on rhetorical level, is a phenomenon that has been marginal for a very long time. Although among Russian academics, uh, we can single out those whose studies were not included in the mentioned volume, but uh, at least... Um, were uh, in the middle for very interesting and very important discussions uh, for Russia about the nature of trauma. Uh, these discussions dealt with the issues of trauma within in the context of national culture in the uh, 20th century. In most cases, in the context of Russian culture, those scholars um, speak of trauma, uh, violence, 
and pain as a phenomenon of totalitarian discourse. And here we can recall the papers and the approaches by Mikhail Ricklin, uh, Mark Lipovetsky, and Brigitte, uh, Brigitte Boimers. Let's stop for a while uh, at the general origins of trauma studies. It draws on critical comments of, of course, surely Sigmund Freud and Otto Rank, despite all the contradictions of his idea of trauma of birth, and therefore represents a vivid example of so-called non-classical studies. So, above all, is the role of psychoanalytic studies. As a result, in the received analytical experience, there is always a trace of psychological reasoning about trauma. Aphasia, amnesia, distress, these are the words from the medical and biological sciences vocabulary, which are often actualized in discussions within trauma studies. Yet at the same time, the structures laid down by, for example, for instance, Freud, that allow one to study the, the observed social and historical contexts of the trauma's activations, in particular the tragic experience of the operational theater during uh, the First World War, also in, inevitably open up the possibilities of uh, transdisciplinary optics for the researcher. So, trauma studies fuses the diverse intellectual heritage. It seeks to penetrate the frontier research fields. It has a hold over different methodologies, subjects, and makes them function according to its own rules. So, the advantages of this position are obvious. There is a convergence of um, research gestures. There is an enrichment of analytical strategies. So, the researcher has to take a meta-subject position, um, combining his or her competences in all the approaches he or her or she demanded, with often unconscious hegemony of psychoanalytic optics. Perhaps that is why the description of the concept of trauma often leads to juggling with uh, such metaphors, as you can see on the screens, metaphors as unrecognizable memory, forgotten, unforgettable, uh, possibility of representation, metapathology. All these concepts can be found in the papers by Viktor Mazin or Valery Podaroga. Interestingly, all this naming attempts shows that trauma avoids any overcoming of itself, especially from the perspective of academic research tending towards psychoanalysis. So, are there any other positions? Of course, they are. Another element of the traumatic discourse is the position of those scholars who, having approached the issue of trauma as the essence of history or as the essence of culture, for various reasons, they chose not to cross this symbolic border. Among those academics, one can identify thinkers who are centered on so-called ontologies of difference. Um, I will drop just a few names, Foucault, Leitre Lombard, Gilles Deleuze, and Felix Guattari, Jacques Derrida, uh, late Jacques Lacan, all that are, and their successors, of course. Despite the differences in the methods used, the main strategy of all the named authors is to study the fragmentation of culture, the phenomenon of a multitude. Even if their statements come into conflict, and they usually are, they reflect particular facets of trauma. Uh, the papers of researchers working with the issues of cultural memory, Halvax, Shirley, um, Asman, uh, both of them, <laughs> philosophers of transgression, uh, Bataille, um, sociologists of culture like Peter Berger or Thomas Lubman, philosophers interested in the fabric of modern history itself, um, I don't know, as Hannah Arendt or Georgia Agamben, are also the basis and at some point even helping hand for those statements. One way or another, but all these researchers hinge on the interest in the genesis of modern culture, based on objective violence or ideological phantasms or catastrophic features of totalitarianism, 
and other um, post-traumatic uh, symptoms, I believe. The thesis about uh, the traumatized culture, sometimes directly discussed, sometimes only implied in such studies, is formed without a constant return to the achievements of classical psychoanalysis in this area. And this is very important. But of course, you can ask, what positions or what approaches of the theory of trauma or within the field of trauma studies do I see as the most representative? Well, for example, it is the research of the historian Dominique Lacapra, one of the pioneers in studying uh, historical and biographical trauma. In his work writing history writing trauma, he introduces the theoretical concepts of acting out and working through memory, with the help of which he describes the specifics of mnemonic reflection on different uh, traumatic experiences. Also, the position of Sergei Ushakin is of a great interest to me. In his papers and also in his monograph, The Patriotism of Despair, Nation, War and Laws in uh, Russia, Culture and Society after Socialism, and um, in the volume Trauma Points mentioned above, he summarizes the anthropological experience in the study of cultural trauma, including some examples from Russian everyday cultural life at the end of the uh, 20th century. And no less important are the views of uh, Mark Lipovetsky in his book uh, uh, called Paralogies, Transformations of Postmodernist Discourse in Russian Culture of the 1920s till uh, 2000s. He marks an effort to study the representation of trauma in Russian literature of the 20th century. Special attention here is paid to the strategies of modern and postmodern literature. Somewhere um, in the fields, but not in the margins, one can see critical comments and crucial comments by uh, Mikhail Riklin, who may not directly expound on the problem of cultural trauma or collective trauma or even collective memory, but form synonymous uh, ideas about the uh, terrorist character of Russian culture itself. And nevertheless, um, I believe it seems impossible to abandon psychoanalysis completely or more precisely post-Freudism uh, when working in the field of trauma studies. I would say that the post-Freudian legacy of Lacan, particularly presented in his later works Name of the Father and seminars published as The Other Side of Psychoanalysis, are also of great interest to me. His optics is devoted to reflections on the real with the capital letter. Uh, as a register of uh, reality. You may be surprised by the statements of even Zizek, uh, who creatively rethought and adopted the psychoanalysis mythology, become, well, also quite essential in the cost context of traumatic reality discussion that Lacan is hinting it. Now Zizek is, as everybody knows, uh, more of a pop philosopher, but his book Violence Six Sideways Reflections and also his book Sublime Object of Ideology reveal a very complete analysis of the nature of precisely cultural trauma. Zizek's rhetoric is based on the belief that trauma is associated with the phenomena of pervasive and ideologically diverse violence and ideological uh, and ideology peculiarities as a um, phantasmatic construct. Of course, indeed, uh, at this point, you may say nothing new, uh, pointing at, uh, I don't know, maybe Terry Eagleton, to say the least. Uh, finally, an appeal to the post-structuralist heritage of Deleuze and Guattari is mm, methodologically necessary here. Their capitalism and schizophrenia and what is philosophy, and also Deleuze's The Logic of Sense and Criticism and Clinic, allow us to take a fresh look at the um, well, semantics of culture and pay attention to its texture and um, resumatism, 
And while thinking about trauma as a phenomenon, escaping rigid and uh, uh, monosemantic meanings, this analytical gesture reveals multiple ways of showing trauma outside the situation of theoretical stability, but inside the frame of metaphorical variability. The choice of such a speculative strategy makes it possible to abandon the repetition of already familiar but not um, consistently successful, strict conceptual structures in favor of the language of artistic practice, which clearly demonstrates the, the trauma. Here and further on the screen, you will see only short quotes. But now I want to talk about what place uh, the philosophers give to trauma while analyzing modernity anyway. They often notice that the culture of the 20th century can be understood as a philosophy of madness. It is widely believed that life in a totalitarian context, which was quite wide, including, for example, living in a Soviet society, reflects a traumatic permanent status rerum. And the subjects of such a society are in a state of constant post-traumatic neurosis. The trauma is born and it is recognized, meanwhile, as typical weirdness. So this approach is all the more correct if we consider that trauma in culture is subjected to multiple acts of discipline. Well, according to Foucault. First, as a um, sacred luck, uh, requiring confessional treatment and one way or another isolation, then as a disease that responds exclusively to special medical and paramedical manipulations, and finally as a specific element of psychological defense that forms the need for philosophical reflection and or ideological processing. So trauma turns out to be the core of various normalization modes, manifesting its identity, our reality, if we recall the Benjamin, Walter Benjamin term, only in the assemblage of characteristics. However, trauma study is some trauma studies is difficult to imagine without examining mental health pictures. Moreover, most psychoanalysts and even psychiatrists believe that the mental norm here and now is impossible, since the normal always hides a neurotic or psychotic in itself. In this case, it is all the more crucial to understand when an ailment loses its characteristics of holiness. A mental dimension at this point begins and accordingly begins the medicalization. And we should ask a question, at what point does the medical discourse lose priority in discussing psychological problems merging with other normalization modes? Well, let's take a look at the nature of illness in this context. Illness can exist as a reality of affliction only in a culture that recognizes it as its own deviation. Society then fixes the disease and not as sacred mania or diabolism when it defines the patient as the bearer of human lack and not I don't know, devilish weakness or delusions or controversially as the keeper of sacred truth. Up to this point, if we discard the corpus of statements about uh, demonical possession, positive religious rhetoric has been in effect. In accordance with it, um, Personified social and moral criticism functions are assigned to the madman, simpleton, the holy fool. So in the West, the West cultures, the holy fool acted as the keeper of wisdom, the forbidden knowledge, the last punishment of man, and at the same time the highest bliss, as uh, Michel Foucault wrote. In the Russian tradition, the uh, so-called foolishness for Christ's sake – 
uh, or in Russian, Yurodivoye Christa Radi, is imaginary insanity as a voluntary, uh, as a voluntary asceticism, uh, accompanied by the obligation to swear at the world in violation of all social norms and conventions. Uh, here you can see the work, the papers by Alexander Panchenko. So, the change in the localization of insanity in Western culture begins with the classical era, and it's crucial for us. Uh, at that point, it is isolated, but not excluded, on the grounds of a still extra-medical, but no longer religious regions uh, or uh, reasons. The movement to endow madness with the role of a culture practice requiring special normalization in Western cultures and takes its form closer to the middle of the 19th century. It was then that the fusion of medical and judicial power took place. It is reflected in particular in the French mental health legislation of, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 1838. In Russia, during, um, according to this period, a conscious medicalization of insanity also begins. The first Russian manuals on mental illness appear. A little later, um, the construction of the regional psychiatric hospitals began. In the latter, patients were placed uh, on the principles of um, curable-incurable. The former uh, remained in the hospital, the latter as unpromising for treatment and management were sent to insane asylums. The differentiation contains the key to understanding the gradual convergence of law and medicine uh, at, at this point here and now in Russian psychiatric. Recognizing the plight of insane asylums, both uh, psychiatrists and authorities have created a community of those who may still be normalized. Finally, this parallel development of cultures merged in the global experience of the mid-20th century. Then any individual who transcends the boundaries of cultural and social conventions no longer feels the impact of exclusively medical knowledge uh, grafted into the judiciary. It is being processed by a particularly sophisticated multi-institution normalization techniques. The number of examples that can be cited here in support of my words uh, is quite large. Here we will restrict ourselves to mentioning such peculiar <laughs> indeed, methods of treatment as uh, metrazole, insulin shock, electroconvulsive therapy, and the whole system of repressive psychiatry in the USSR. However, clinical pictures are not a collection of exclusively abnormal facts. They are partly constitution. Uh, constituted by the adaptive reactions of the organism, which functions according to its own norm. The disease is woven from the same functional tissue as normal adaptation. This observation also concerns the mechanisms of psychological defense, the purpose of which, in both healthy and unhealthy states of mind, is to eliminate the source of anxiety and to return the personality to a state of uh, comfort. But what is the comfort? The intricacies begin if we think about the specifics of this um, concept in one case or another. While neuroscientists see a deficit in the nervous system and psychoanalysis repression, uh, philosophers practically remark that which cannot be said should be passed over in silence. It's Wittgenstein, by the way. This observation conceals a fairly, fairly transparent understanding of the transition mechanism from psychiatry and, more broadly, any previous experience of human existence perception to psychoanalysis. This gesture marks a gradual refusal to endow mental deviations with the presumption of illness. Now a number of deviations, so-called deviations, are left with the status of the shadow 
of the norm, requiring the intervention of non-religious and non-medical discipline mechanisms. We can say that from the very moment each person recognizes uh, the fact of using psychological protection measures, we enter the zone of jurisdiction of psychoanalysis. It was Freud who tried to create and structure a kind of supra medical description of the mechanism of this defense, highlighting, well, for instance, sublimation, repression, regression, etc. The combination of several measures simultaneously in his uh, opinion leads to the emergence of various forms of neurosis, including hysteria. Of course, in the currently valid international classifications of diseases, uh, this diagnosis is not used due to its ambiguity. However, analyzing the emergence and functioning of trauma in culture and theory of trauma, we are forced to operate with this concept in connection with the need to refer to the experience of um, psychoanalysis, which was designed to remove the label of deviation from traumatic uh, neurosis. Psychoanalysis itself, uh, as you can recall, began as the study of the manifestation of individual symptoms that may have a psychogenic nature. Uh, this is how an intuitive, intuitive, yes, guess was born in psychiatry at first. The delirium of those who, of those with mental conditions, we'll say, should be recognized as meaningful. So doctors just do not have enough tools to become full-fledged interpreters and translators. It was in 1893, when Joseph Preur and Freud proposed to focus the attention of specialists on violations of the repression defense mechanism. Their book on the uh, psychical mechanism of hysterical phenomena argued those called hysterics, well, today we prefer to use person first language towards people with mental disorders, as we uh, of course, no. So those people mostly suffer from memories. More precisely, they suffer from inability to remember some fragment, uh, some fragment of the repressed, and perhaps the most important one. In any case, the source of hysterical disorder is extremely strong excitement from the outside, and a violation of this protection mechanism, the mechanism of protection against irritation of different genesis should be considered as trauma. In response to the failure of a psychological blockade of unpleasant and or unacceptable events, um, I don't know, senses, the body mobilizes, mobilizes all defenses, all energy to create an extremely strong compensation. Functioning as an adequate response to the challenge of external stimuli, it doesn't pose a danger. On the contrary, it can serve as the basis for creative sublimation. In the systematizing lectures uh, that uh, were given and written as, I'm not mistaken, in 1916-1917, Freud detected the similarity of this symptomology uh, with the arrays of psychiatric dat data on the so-called traumatic neurosis, uh, resulting from the unprecedented uh, number of people involved in a traumatic situation in wartime uh, during the First World War, as I mentioned before. In the presence of differences recording when comparing traumatic and spontaneous neurosis, one significant similarity was striking. Both categories of people are fixed or were fixed at the moment of injury. These incidents do not just shake all the foundations of the old life, but forever leave people in front of a gaping trauma. Later, however, Freud admits, in the absence of um, complete understanding of both military neurosis and traumatic neurosis of peacetime, the researcher can only guess about the etiological conditions of um, such deviations. Uh, for example, about the presence of a moment of fear um, uh, 
The only conclusion about the nature of traumatic neurosis, which was extrapolated by, by well, generations of researchers um, to discussion of the nature of cultural trauma, uh, is as follows. Traumatic neurosis is a consequence of a severe shock experienced for which a person could not be prepared either, um, either culturally or socially. However, all the traumatized people, all the traumatized subjects are not obliged to re replenish the cohort of neurotic patients or patients with, uh, with shell shock or patients with post-traumatic stress disorder. You can call these conditions uh, various names. Otherwise, doctors would have uh, recorded massive psychosis. Trauma becomes manifest only when it distorts the mechanism of forgetting, fixing the person on a certain event without allowing the experience of the past to sink into oblivion or to fit into the order of things. Typically, the tendency to forget the unpleasant is universal. Collective problems are satisfied with collective compensations, and the trauma is hidden behind rituals, gradually regulating the course of events. Well, perhaps the universality of this principle um, explains that even such metastructures as national identity and ideology today are built on ritualizing narrative models. Preference is given to them and not to the reflective laws with the capital L and um, disciplinary regulations grounded by reason. A striking example of this is the limitation uh, concepts uh, like the fate of Russia, Russian life, Russian destiny, instead of my own life. They were noted by the anthropologist Nancy Rees in Soviet perestroika conversations and depicted in her book Russian Talk. They were used to present reality as an epic story, as an invariant legend. In such metaphorical models, there is no elaboration of the deep, tragic foundations of everyday life and culture. However, despite the presence of those unspoken gaps, the cultural connection, as it seems, remain, remains. In general, these specific memory gaps indicate conscious or unconscious censorship. A person's own eye is protected to a certain extent, crippling itself. Those who have an idea of the normative integrity are able to detect such flaws. And this is what few people uh, of invariant tragic culture, for example, Russian culture, can boost off. At the same time, when appealing to psychoanalytic experience, direct trauma remains an unattainable. Uh, and impenetrable core around which memory and narrative are built. The writing of trauma caused by the authoritarian involvement uh, of psychoanalysis may look different, but unfortunately, as it was mentioned on the previous screen, it lacks the possibility of ultimately conceptualizing its central plot, its narrative and essential core. Um, Suppose a researcher strives to see the post-traumatic symptom of obsessive repetition as, well, I don't know, a subconscious desire to return to trauma in order to experience and assimilate it. In that case, he or she will be faced with, um, with inexpressibility of the memory, which will be compensated by racialized gestures, symbolic cliché as Nancy Rees found out. Suppose he or she pays attention to phobias, behind which the post-traumatic life hides uh, and hides the desire to avoid reproducing any painful gestures. In that case, he or she will face flashbacks that do not disturb reality, but testify to its redundancy. In any case, the researcher will face gridlock and will have to admit 
any event that occurs a moment earlier that is necessary in order to become part of our full-fledged experience can become a trauma. Uh, this uh, was the quote uh, from the paper by Katie Karut. Um, and that paper was, uh, was okay, can be found in the volume Trauma Points. Hence, the researcher will face the symbolic inadequacy and impossibility of presenting the story or of what happened. He or she will face the disruption between the experience and its understanding, non-speaking and silence, at least. At some point, I turn to the Lacan's heritage and let's go back to him for, for a moment. Let me remind you that according to Lacan, any culture is a consequence and at the same time the cause of the fundamental uh, imbalance, a traumatic beginning, a break, by which a person is separated from nature, because there is nature and there is always culture. This is the law of the last structure, relating to the register of the real. Reality rushes to this gap and singularity, but never reaches it fully, perceiving it as its own limit. Human existence itself conforms to it. In fact, the real is a set of extreme points that individuals feel like an experience of extreme states that are never perceived to the full end. Uh, as an experience of radical violations, the real is such a psychic instance which includes the needs, impulses and aspirations necessary for a person but they pose a danger. These elements of the real are not given um, in a rationalized form, such as trauma, which is one of the modalities of uh, the real in, in the context of uh, Lacan views and optics. It is worth noting that Lacan's views on the concept of the real and on the concept of trauma are, by the way, perhaps the most mystical elements of his philosophy, underwent a certain evolution. In the 1950s, the real was understood as the rough, pre-symbolic reality, and the trauma was read as an imaginary entity that had not yet undergone found, uh, final symbolization. However, later on, the real is separated by Lacan from other registers of everyday social reality, the symbolic and the imaginary, also with the capital letters. Already in the 1970s, the real as the field of intense pleasure and intense pain, full of catastrophes, horrors and extremis, uh, extremism, is not located at the same space with the reality of our daily affairs, of our daily deeds. This is ontologically impossible. As a set of traumas, the real constitutes itself in a form of a rejection of the key cultural signifiers, emptiness. And the trauma is described as an upper core of culture that resists symbolization, but is necessary due to its repressed nature. Note that a particular character of negation distinguishes the content of the catastrophic real of the 20th century. This content of wars, revolutions and related uh, victims and witnesses. By the way, I knowingly use the term contact here instead of the term um, experience uh, for the real shies away the internalization process, and there is no experience, as we can imagine, without internalization. So it is an experience of lack, of gap, which marks the specific civilization development. On the one hand, the implementation of these catastrophes was programmed by the culture itself and could not but happen. Moreover, this traumatic challenge to culture serves as an impetus for the new round in the development of society. On the other hand, the realization of these catastrophes were accompanied by gestures and acts so shocking that meeting with them in the verbal or physical spaces seems um, 
quite undesirable. In this case, any statements about the details of catastrophes indicate the impossibility of a reaction other than silence or we can call it symbolic stammering. When there are no clear and unambiguous words for the rational designation of the experienced, silence acts as the brightest marker of pain. Thus, the available evidence of survivors, say in concentration camps, is not aimed at describing the torture paced uh, catastrophe best, but demonstrates a um, quite superhuman desire to be saved in these unbearable conditions, unbearable contents. Context. As Primo Levi, an Italian writer of Jewish descent who survived the Holocaust, wrote in The Drowned and the Saved, uh, it is 1986, sorry there will be not quotation but the paraphrase, I wanted to see everything, experience everything and keep everything in me. But why, if I still can never shout to the world? that I was saved. Well, just because I was not going to withdraw myself, I was not going to destroy the witness that I could become. The mutinous of such evidence is obvious. The victim's testimony cannot be used in any court because the victim is too interested in the outcome. Therefore, even the cries of the injured, of the traumatized, I am one of the sorry, I am one of the survivors, manifest uh, some kind of cohesion of the victim and the executioner figures and accordingly collective responsibility. No wonder that in Claude Lanzmann's Shoah, uh, film Shoah, movie Shoah, not only former prisoners act as witnesses, but also their executioners, assess officers who worked in the camps. Hence, the disaster and the trauma that follows is never seen or given the attention it deserves, it clearly deserves. Its perspective may be obvious, but it's impossible to believe in it and voice it, no matter how likely it may seem. This feature characterizes the behavior of the uh, heroes of the characters, the famous film uh, Life, is, uh, Life is Beautiful. The memory of the disaster is also quite problematic. A person is ready to recognize it as the past, but he or she is not left with the confidence that it will never happen again. An error of primary, even pre-scientific conceptualization is formed here. It seems that the information about the catastrophe is the description of the event, which guarantees illusionary confidence in the impossibility of its return. Surely this confidence is reassuring, but it is fundamentally erratic. If the description of the trauma is carried out as a description of something impossible, then the trauma disappears from the sphere of public responsibility. Thus, the trauma appears as an ideal event, either inaccessible to the everyday perception or opposed to such an understanding. Suppose the individual is ready to recognize the continuity of culture and continuity of trauma. In that case, the story is built according to ready-made frames in accordance with the acceptable cultural, political, social codes. So hence, the trauma is just mythologized. As social scientists note in this regard, multiple attempts to talk about trauma as the ideal event give way to constructing some understandable pseudo pseudo events which is to say the reason of uh, the reason for media coverage yeah. for this uh, reason culture is filled with fear of what cannot be meant therefore the trauma of the past lies outside the realm of meaning thus indifference if not some kind of autistic disorder arising as a response to traumas of the past uh, and it is a 
consequence of adequate psychological defense measures and also a reaction to the presence of an unprocessed rough invasion of the past real with the capital letter. Such a reaction is considered legitimate. Otherwise, this, uh, other, otherwise their speech looks like a bunch of limitation reflecting an apathetic negative, uh, negative uh, identity. Psychoanalysis, so, doesn't offer cardinal solutions in a collision work, in a collision with the, the real, which threatens the deep rootedness in language, endangers habitual, uh, habitual existence. Its followers argue that radical course for immediate action here, let's do something for witnesses to be given the right to have a say, uh, to be heard, are fraught with an anti-theoretical measure and are playing with the concept of empathy, which is not applicable here. In turn, the so-called critics and in particular Deleuze, Guattari, uh, Derrida, Vachar, argue that there is a strategy that combines, uh, combines theoretical reflections and et- extra-theoretical uh, experience. This strategy comes as an attempt to speak out the impenetrable fabric of existence. The real is traumatic due to the absence of the symbolizing. This brings us back to the question of the need for the, a discourse of trauma. It seems to, uh, to me that it is no coincidence that neither for Freud approach nor for Lacan's approach, uh, trauma and the real have not become key subjects. True to its impenetrable nature, the trauma indicates its presence to the researchers but did not allow itself to be spoken, to be presented, fully presented. Um, it is ready to open to open up only to those who are not afraid to plunge into their darkness negation to those whom she had once touched trauma speaks only to trauma only with trauma the rest is the construction of the image of the injured of the image of traumatized of course it is it's very useful work For instance, we need to preserve the catastrophe and trauma awareness to the public sphere, within the public sphere. Suppose we pay attention to the language reproduced in those traumatized, in so-called primary or secondary witnesses, including bystanders, who have the courage to speak and testify. In that case, in that case we came closer to understanding the trauma. Of course, surely we... we We make efforts, but of course, we don't come closer to understanding her nature. Surely, for there is, for there is none, for there is no such thing as a nature of trauma. There, there are only her writing strategies, and I would like to talk about them. To understand the writing of trauma. One must remember that its study can be based on three more strategies, and these strategies were pointed out by Sergei Ushakin. These strategies are trauma as a plot, trauma as a loss, and trauma as a consolidating event. The first approach is based on attempts to fix the place and meaning of the traumatic experience in words, things, rituals. Trauma is used as something like narrative matrix, the logic of plot. And the author is a witness and victim whose experience is compelling. Uh, It is his or her biography and identity that construct the reality around him or her, which in turn doesn't exist outside the experienced but not overcome grief. Often trauma is plot unfolds in a discursive logic that Eric Sandner, the historian Eric Sandner, calls narrative fetishism. This is such a slightly lulling strategy characterized by the demonstration of catastrophes and traumas as iconic and conventionally familiar events. In general, many great films and great movies um, about, for instance, Holocaust are built on this logic. The trauma is loss approach focuses on the traces of 
overestimation of the no longer present whole uh, found in everyday life of the present. These traces constitute a language in the mode of an absent event, and they, being reproducible, form heritage and memory as a distorted repetition of trauma. Here one can also find the traces of nostalgic modes used to represent the past, and the issues of nostalgia were well depicted in papers by Svetlana Boim. I advise to look them through. Finally, the study of uh, trauma as consolidating event asserts the purpose of writing to form an understanding real or ideal audience, for which it is ontologically necessary to mark the traces of loss and their discursive stabilization. The experience of pain becomes the determining factor for the formed community, which serves as the basis for both consolidation and differentiation. Since, as I tried to show, uh, the history of the studying of trauma is multifaceted, both, clinic, uh, sorry, both clinicians, uh, both psychiatrists, psychoanalysts, and their critics, post uh, Freudians, post structuralists, uh, tend to agree that trauma should not be directly quoted with a variety of, path of pathological phenomena and psychiatric disorders. Rather, it can be said that the identification of trauma as a symptom, uh, an instrument of the disease, is the first step towards the appropriate analytics. I should be borne in mind, uh, or it should be borne in mind that the language of trauma is a human cry uh, accompanying the story of loss and painful change. Uh, and it is quotation from the uh, mentioned book by Nancy Rees, only partly belongs to the ethnography of suffering and to which registers and discourses of reality it does belong, I sure, I'm sure you will find out during this course. I would like just here to add that many of the authors I have cited today have made rollovers in their studies. When they started talking about individual experiences. They notice similarities between individual and collective experiences. And while we understand that the concept of collective body is questionable, even such an opponent of lay trauma theory as Jeffrey Alexander once defined collective, namely cultural trauma. He wrote that cultural trauma occurs when members of a community feel they have been forced to go through some horrific event uh, that leaves um, marks in their group consciousness and is forever printed in their memory and radically alters their future identity. And then he added that the cultural trauma narrative could be purposely created uh, to shape the master memorial narratives. They consist of explaining the nature of pain through the eyes of, first of all, victims and witnesses. They consist of demonstrating the victim's connection to a wider audience, and they, uh, and they consist of assigning responsibility, essentially answering the question of who is to blame. And actually, um, I would not say that I prefer this approach. That is why it appears only in the, at the end of the, uh, our talk today. Because it declares the trauma to be a consciously constructed experience. And we remember that trauma as a collision with the radical real cannot be presented as an experience. How can it be transformed uh, then into a constructed and consistent narrative with which one can blame and defend, if it even can be an experience. Therefore, for example, Holocaust survivors, the Holocaust survivors from Lonsman uh, movie Shoah, cried when asked about their experience. In the post-war years, in a newly rebuilt life, they could not accommodate what happened before. Hence, Jeffrey Alexander's approach seems to be an attempt to describe the discursive strategies, very suitable for peacetime 
and completely inappropriate conditions uh, while we are thinking about them within traumatic and, and catastrophic context. But of course, I can see how this approach working uh, in media products that deal with trauma. These products indeed put a special effort in constructing master memorial narrative. This, for instance, is the Instagram project, Yeva Stories, Yeva dot Stories, which uses reenactment technologies to tell the story of a Hungarian girl who died in the Holocaust. Uh, if you read about this project, it will become clear that it was greeted with a fair amount of irony and even aggression and indignation. Many viewers uh, felt that they were being manipulated to create an effect of empathy and teach them how to remember the trauma correctly. And here we get into the last paradox that I would like to point out regarding trauma. And it is, I believe, the interesting one. It not only uses only mutilated and crippled language, any attempt to portray the very crippling nature of the catastrophic event that triggers the trauma is questionable. So the trauma hides behind the shadows of a catastrophe. But even a catastrophe is not allowed to be fully imagined. It turns out that due to this discursive inadequacy, the imperative remembering so as not to repeat doesn't work. This means that catastrophes and traumas will be, unfortunately, repeated. And that is quite logical. Trauma is an element of the real. And the real defines the boundaries of our life. In order to live, one must assume the possibility of being traumatized, whatever it means. Thank you.